and good evening, Facebook viewers. Thank you for joining our TIFF talk this evening. My name is Lynn McFadden. I'm a market development manager for Endogastric Solutions, and I'll be your host tonight for the show. And with me tonight, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Karen Gertz. She will be feeding us some questions that come in through the chat throughout the session. And um, also with us this evening is Dr. Peter Janu from Appleton, Wisconsin. Good evening, so, Lynn. Good evening, and thanks for joining us, Dr. Janu. I'm just going to do a quick introduction to, um, to our viewers. Um, uh, read your bio for them, Dr. Janu. Sure. So Dr. Peter Janu is a surgeon at Fox Valley Surgical Special Specialist in Appleton, Wisconsin. He has a special interest in heartburn and reflux disease, as well as minimally invasive laparoscopic techniques, endoscopic surgery, robotic surgery, nutritional support, and hernia surgery. Dr. Janu developed and directed the region's first reflux center of excellence and has received national recognition for minimally invasive procedures for the treatment of heartburn and reflux. He has been teaching and proctoring other physicians, both nationally and internationally. Welcome this evening, Dr. Janu. Thanks for having me, Lynn. A pleasure. Uh, this evening, you might notice there's a different brand to our um, to our session tonight, and that's because the month of November is a special month when it comes to reflux. It's GERD Awareness Week, the week of Thanksgiving, so November 21st through 27th. And our organization, Endogastric Solutions, does um, obviously a lot to rally around uh, providing education and awareness about GERD. Um, but this month, especially, we're doing something um, a little extra and we're also raising awareness about um, hunger and food insecurities in the United States. And so we know that one in five U.S. adults suffer from GERD, um, but we also learned that one in eight American adults suffer from hunger and food insecurities. So along with GERD Awareness Week and giving um, our viewers a lot of education and knowledge around uh, reflux and, and how it impacts people, we're also asking you to think about um, making some GERD friendly food donations to your local food banks in your holiday giving this year. Um, the reason being is a lot of times folks with heartburn and reflux have a hard time finding uh, reflux friendly foods at their local food bank. So uh, this is our two pronged effort to uh, do uh, uh, education and awareness around both GERD and um, and hunger across the United States. So um, that will be our theme throughout the month of November. And um, we just encourage you to get um, involved and give in any way you can. So thank you for that. Um, this is a live session. So I just wanna make a reminder for everyone to please post their questions in the chat section and Karen will do a great job of fielding those throughout the session. And to kick us off, Dr. Giano, if you could please tell everyone just give them a definition briefly about what is GERD or gastroesophageal reflux disease. Yeah, so GERD is kind of just a, a shorter version of saying that gastroesophageal reflux disease. It's a long word and it's hard to say over and over again. So we've just kind of shortened it to make it a little bit easier. But basically it's the concept that the content within your stomach is going the wrong direction and becomes bothersome. And if it's happening every so often that it's kind of supposed to do that. There's a, a valve or a flap valve at the end of the esophagus or the food tube so that when you eat and food gets into your stomach, if you need to vent your stomach or let out a little bit of gas or belch, you can. But when things start going the wrong direction and start becoming more bothersome, that's when we call it gastroesophageal reflux disease, when it becomes more lifestyle limiting. Wonderful, thank you for that. So how do you see patients presenting in your practice or what kind of symptoms do they come to you expressing both atypical and atypical symptoms? Well, that's a great question because people come at it from a variety of different directions and the symptoms that people experience aren't necessarily always the typical ones that you describe. And most of the time people suffer from things like chest pain or heartburn or a feeling of regurgitation that you know the content is going the wrong direction. But it's not unusual for people to come in or present with issues where tr there's trouble swallowing, where if they eat something, it just doesn't feel like it's going down right. Sometimes people feel things coming up in the back of their throat or they're waking up at night. Sometimes it's things like coughing or clearing of their throat if the content is going far enough that it ends up in the back of their mouth or going down the wrong pipes. 
people can uh, have those manifestations, which is not necessarily typical of the standard heartburn. Sometimes people just don't feel that or don't have that sensitivity, and they're bothered more by the fact that the content is going the wrong direction. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for sharing that. So when they have these sensations or maybe just not knowing what the next step should be, um, who would they see to be evaluated and what kind of tests might be involved in that kind of uh, workup or consultation? Well, most of the time, you know, something that uh, people will bring up with their primary care provider uh, or their uh, local physician, and uh, they might find that um, if they're bothered enough by it, those people would refer them for some further investigation. And typically it involves, you know, taking a look inside the stomach mostly to make sure that there's nothing more serious going on. Because one of the worrisome things that can happen for people that have long-standing issues with heartburn or reflux is that the stomach is designed to hold things, but the esophagus, which is basically just a transit tube, isn't. And if things are going the wrong direction, the esophagus doesn't necessarily like it. And it can lead to inflammation. It can lead to things like ulcers. It can lead to things like strictures where food gets hung up or doesn't pass through as well because it's a little bit more narrowed. And then over time, depending on how significant the inflammation can be, it can even increase the risk of development of cancer. Mm -hmm. So testing for this is primarily designed to make sure that the, none of these more serious things are occurring and, and trying to determine what, if anything, you can do to try to stop things from, from happening like that. Right, thank you. So you touched a little bit on, uh, it potentially could progress to something more serious. Um, when you say esophageal cancer, um, you talk a little bit about um, Barrett's esophagus. I know oftentimes we have folks on these sessions who ask about Barrett's esophagus, and I think that uh, might be a nice, uh, just something to describe what that is. And, and that's a great question. Barrett's esophagus is an interesting uh, uh, adaptation that your body makes uh, to adjust to the content of the stomach going the wrong direction. The stomach, again, is designed to hold on to things, but if things are going the wrong direction, your esophagus tries to become more like the stomach. And that change from one cell type to another cell type is what can predispose to turning into other cell types, which progress and turn into cancer. Now, typically, it takes a, a longer period of time to do it, and some people are going to be more predisposed to it than others. For people that, let's say, are smoking cigarettes or have a family history of esophageal cancer, those people are at much higher risk of that progression. So then once someone has the workup and tests done and they've gotten a, a GERD diagnosis, um, what are what are some of the things they can do to, to manage their GERD? Let's say medical management and um, some options there. Well, sure. So, you so know, first, you know, first and foremost, we try to drill down on why people are having the symptoms that they're having. And in many circumstances, it ends up being dietary to some extent, in the sense that in a supersized society, you know, more is better. And if people are always filling up their stomachs or eating a little bit too fast or a little bit too much or a little bit too rich, there's a tendency for things not to necessarily digest as well and they can back up. And if things, um, if your diet can be adjusted, a lot of times just uh, simply watching the portion sizes is all that's needed. And, you know, there's certain triggers that can make symptoms worse. Sometimes people can be more sensitive to things like if they're drinking alcohol or if they're, let's say, eating a pizza before they go to sleep at night. Those are all things that can be modified to make the symptoms better. If people are still having problems despite trying to watch their dry diet and try to behave themselves, a lot of times people will go towards taking some type of medications to cut down the acid in the stomach. Most of the medications are over the counter now. They're heavily advertised and they're pretty ubiquitous. I think, you know, people have a knee jerk tendency <clears throat> to simply jump right to that because by taking the medications uh, in many ways, it can make people feel better or at least it can treat some of the symptoms. Now, ultimately what those medications do is simply taking the acid away from the composition of the stomach. The best way I describe it to patients that if you were to have a paper cut and I asked you if you wanted me to put lemon juice or water on that paper cut, well, water might bother you, but it's not gonna burn and sting as much as the, as the lemon juice. 
So whether or not you're taking Pepsid or Prilosec or Omeprazole or Prevacid or Dexalant or Nexium or any of the other number of uh, medications that are available, all those medications turn lemon juice to water so that if it does go the wrong direction, it might not burn and sting as much. It doesn't necessarily stop things from going the wrong direction, but it just changes that composition. But if it makes you feel better, it's certainly not uh, a bad thing. However, as people start taking more and more of these medications over time, um, it, it tends to cover up some of the symptoms. And the medicines themselves do have some potential side effects or consequences as you take them long term, as far as potentially impacting the risk of uh, development of fractures over time. It can affect how your kidneys filter because they're filtered by the, the kidneys. And it can affect the balance of bacteria on your insides because acid will tend to eliminate any bacteria that you eat. And if there's no acid there, you can take things in that would then affect the balance of the normal bacteria that are helping fight off infections in your body. So there are some potential negative consequences of being on these medications long term. But ultimately, the people that come to see me are more bothered by the fact that the content is going the wrong direction. And that ends up being something that's more along the lines of a mechanical barrier that's failed as far as that kind of flap valve or that one way valve is now allowing things to go the wrong way. Wonderful. Thank you for that um, explanation. I know on these we do get a lot of questions regarding uh, PPI and long term use and, um, you know, people are are concerned about staying on them for, for a long time. Um, and oftentimes we're hearing they're not aware of anything else. So it's not until they go the gamut of going from PCP to potentially ENT to GI and back again, maybe that they are finally introduced to um, some other alternative therapies or other, other interventions. So what other treatment options would there be if you're not talking med uh, medication management, lifestyle and um, activity management, what other ways uh, can you treat reflux? So, you know, it, it, those are great questions because there, there was a period of time where um, surgery for reflux was pretty common, um, but there was really only one surgical option where it involved a, a type of surgery that in the past had been done through larger incisions. It migrated to being done through smaller incisions in the early to mid 90s and involved changing the shape of the stomach and wrapping it around the end of your esophagus to create kind of a blood pressure cuff type effect that the more full your stomach is, the tighter that air cuff would pinch down, the less that could go the opposite direction. And that's very effective, but at the same time would come at the cost of some side effects or some potential risk. And I think that um, over time, people migrated away from it because ultimately the outcomes of the surgery were a little bit based on how bad was your reflux symptoms before the surgery and what were your side effects afterwards. If the side effects outweighed the, the issues that you were having with the reflux, you felt worse after the surgery. And so it was hard for people to make that leap of faith if you weren't necessarily sure how well you were going to uh, come out after that surgery. Now that surgery is still done and it's still very effective and it's still considered the standard of care. But now there are more minimally invasive options that people can entertain. And there's a lot more scientific evidence suggesting that that mechanical barrier um, it can deteriorate over time, especially uh, depending on diet and lifestyle and, and, and a variety of other number of factors. And the mechanical barriers is what can achieve better satisfaction or control of reflux than simply covering things up with medications alone. Sure, thank you for that. I think uh, before we dive into some other um, procedural interventions, um, Karen, I think we have some questions from the, the chat area. Great, great. We do. Good evening, Dr. Janu. We've got um, we've got several questions on hiatal hernias. Uh, we've got one from Diane. Uh, does a hiatal hernia and reflux um, come along together? Like what causes a hiatal hernia? And then we've got a question, is it, does GERD or a hiatal hernia cause heart, cause heart palpitations? So it's kind of a two-part question. Well, that's a great question. So let, let's go back a little bit and talk about anatomy. So the way that the system is set up on your insides is that your esophagus, which is the tube that connects your mouth to your stomach, has to pass through your chest in order to get to your stomach. 
And the passageway that it goes through the muscles of your diaphragm, which is your breathing muscle, that passageway is called the diaphragmatic hiatus, which is Latin for hole in the diaphragm. So it sounds a little bit more impressive than it actually is, but that's where the term hiatal hernia comes from. And it basically just means that that passageway is a little bit bigger than what it's supposed to be. When the passageway is nice and snug around the esophagus, with your breathing, it kind of moves up and down and actually pinches in on the esophagus above the stomach. And that's the normal anatomical configuration. If that passageway gets stretched out or larger, well, number one, it can't pinch in on the esophagus appropriately to try to reduce the content from going the wrong direction. And at the same time, the wider that that passageway is stretched out, the more that that pressure, the, the effect of trying to take a deep breath will also try to pull the stomach up into the chest. And so it can change the location or the proper positioning of where the basically the plumbing is supposed to be. And that's where it can throw off that valve. And so um, the, the diaphragmatic hernia or the hiatal hernia probably contributes about 50% of the barrier mechanism. And then the flap valve at the end of the esophagus contributes the other 50%. If that barrier gets stretched out or flattened, that flat valve will become more like a saloon door, which then allows things to go the wrong direction. And so the hiatal hernia certainly contributes to the effect of content going the wrong direction. Now, whether or not that content can lead to issues of heart palpitations, it's certainly a possibility. Um, because your body reacts in different ways. There's a variety of different nerves in that area that control a variety of different things. And so in as much as that's an uncommon manifestation, it's certainly a possibility because it can throw things off a little bit. Thank you so much for that uh, explanation. Uh, I, I love the saloon door analogy. That's great. Uh, we have one more question before I um, bring it back to Lynn to kind of before we talk about TIFF. But uh, Sheila has a question. Can you see reflux? It is, is it a yellowish white fluid leaving a coating on my tongue at night or is that something else? So, you know, the, the concept of reflux is just the content of the stomach going the wrong direction. And whether or not that leads to some of these manifestations on your tongue, it certainly can. Um, the farther that you get away from the stomach, there's other things that can contribute to that as well. Whether it's the esophagus not squeezing or pushing things through, whether it could be related to sinus drainage, whether or not it could be related to sensitivity to food or sensitivity and environment or allergies, like if you're in Austin, Texas, which is really bad nowadays. Um, there's any variety of different things that can do it. Typically, if we're concerned that reflux or the content of the stomach going the wrong direction could be contributing, we'll do some information gathering or investigations. And certainly one is that test where we look inside the stomach to kind of gauge what the anatomy looks like. Um, looking inside the stomach will make sure that there's nothing more serious as far as like ulcers or infections or cancers. But in many ways, it's a little bit like walking out to a parking lot and looking at a car in the sense that you can tell if it's clean or if it's pink, but you can't necessarily tell how well it works or how well it runs. And so a lot of times we'll do a test called an esophagram or a barium swallow, which is an x-ray test where you'd swallow some stuff down that shows up on x-rays that doesn't taste particularly good, but it will show how the esophagus is squeezing. I'm not a farmer, but it's supposed to kind of squeeze like this. And it, they have people bend over or lie flat to see how much is coming back the opposite direction to see how significant that reflux is. Sometimes we'll do even fancier tests where we'll actually put a computer chip clipped to the lining of the esophagus at the time of an endoscopy that actually measures acid levels that helps kind of determine how often it's happening. And the little computer chip sits in there for anywhere from 48 to 96 hours. And after the battery runs out, it just sloughs off and passes. People will typically carry around a little recorder that's about the size of a cell phone that will record the output that comes out of it. And it'll tell any time acid goes the wrong direction. And acid as you know, a surrogate for content will show how often things are going the wrong direction. Typically, we'll have people write down when they're eating and when they're lying down because it makes a little bit of a difference for when things occur. And there's a button on the recorder that says, I can feel my symptom and whether or not that symptom is chest pain or regurgitation or heartburn or coughing, 
clearing of the throat. One lady called it a fizzle. It kind of doesn't matter. It's the symptom that you're experiencing. It'll tell at the time that that was happening whether or not that was related to acid coming back up on you. So we can help correlate what goes on your insides and actually objectively measure it to what extent it's occurring. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Karen, did you say um, no more questions at the moment? No more at the moment. Okay, wonderful. Thank you for um, diving into that. We do get a lot of questions about hiatal hernia and just those various symptoms that people are, are presenting with. So um, you touched a little bit about um, the Nissen thumb duplication. Um, tell us a little bit about the TIF procedure for reflux and what that is and um, how that works. So the idea behind the TIF procedure is kind of an idea of reconstructing the natural flap valve configuration at the end of the esophagus. Normally, the esophagus is supposed to go through that passageway in the muscles of the diaphragm and then go a little bit farther yet before it actually empties into the stomach. So there's a little bit of length that's supposed to be below the level of the diaphragm. And there's supposed to be kind of this flap valve configuration that should allow things to pass through, but should flap shut if things go the wrong direction. If that valve gets flattened, or perhaps let's say flips backwards like that saloon door analogy, the TIF procedure is designed to reconstruct that kind of normal flap valve configuration. And it's done with a device that I describe as a fancy sewing machine in the sense that we use the standard gastroscope in addition with this device to go inside the stomach. We flip around and look back up from inside the stomach at that connection between the esophagus and stomach and actually have a system of being able to grab that tissue and pull it down to increase that length. In doing so, it folds the stomach up alongside the esophagus to create that higher pressure zone, much in the same way that a traditional fundoplication would do. But rather than changing the stomach and wrapping or changing the shape of the stomach and wrapping it around, we're doing it naturally in kind of the normal configuration that's supposed to exist. The stitches that we put in are typically anywhere around 30 stitches and they're put in almost like rivets in an airplane wing so they're distributed so there's not one point of tension it's a little bit more distributed compared to the traditional fund application that has a single seam of stitches that gets pulled on when the stomach gets inflated so it has a lot less of that tension effect plus the stitches are put in while the stomach is already inflated so they're already at their maximum tension point so those stitches that we put in don't get pulled on like a traditional fund application and because it's natural and we don't go all the way around we go around about 300 degrees around it allows for a little give or flex so it still allows you to vent your stomach to some extent and it has a much less of a consequence on swallowing. So from a side effect profile, reconstructing this valve in the normal natural configuration um, has a far less uh, lower side effect profile, but can be considered almost equally as effective at controlling the content from going the wrong direction. Oh, excellent, thank you. Um, so what do you hear from your patients in follow-up after you've um, done the TIF procedure? What are they saying? What I'm, is, is life? better is life different what do you hear well you know a lot of times you know the, the the first and foremost thing is to make sure that heartburn and reflux is the primary component of the symptoms that they're experiencing if we gather enough information whether it's through any of these investigations that we described and it's truly a matter of content of the stomach going the wrong direction particularly for patients that don't necessarily have a big hiatal hernia. And when I say big, we usually use two centimeters or less as kind of this determination as to whether or not something that can be done purely endoscopically. And I'll explain why that makes a little bit of a difference. But for those patients that are having symptoms that medications are no longer helping with, in many ways they're having kind of either clearing their throat or coughing or some of the manifestations of the content going the wrong direction. Reconstructing the valve in this manner is a very safe and effective way that has very little risk or side effect to improve on those symptoms. And what people find is that it has a significant improvement on that kind of regurgitation aspect of it. Most patients are able to go off their medications entirely. Usually we say about 75 to 80% of the time people are off their medications at five years. 
Um, the nice thing about it is that it it doesn't have the side effects or consequences as far as swallowing or inability to vent to stomach or belch. And typically it doesn't have some of the other untoward side effects as far as bloating that some of the more traditional fundoplication procedures go. So from the standpoint of being effective as far as a treatment option with a very low side effect profile, people are very satisfied with the overall results. Okay. Very nice, thank you. And you mentioned, we talked a little bit about hiatal hernia. Is the TIF procedure able to be done in conjunction with a hiatal hernia repair if someone has a hernia that's, let's say, larger than the two centimeters you mentioned? It's a great question. Initially, you know, when the device was developed, and I've been doing this since about 2010, so we've done over 600 patients now. Um, you know, initially the idea was that this was primarily for patients who had no significant hiatal hernia or minimal. And the reason behind that was that we didn't really know exactly the contributing factor that the hiatus or the muscles the diaphragm had on the valve component. And so if we just reconstructed the valve, that's very good, provided that the other mechanism is working okay as far as that diaphragm. And for patients that have that less than two centimeters, by creating that fold or that thickening, it might not necessarily fix a small hiatal hernia, but it, it addresses it by kind of filling in those gaps by making it a little bit thicken. And so it allows that the barrier of the muscles of the diaphragm to actually impact that new valve. For patients that have a larger hiatal hernia, basically that involves trying to make those muscles a little bit more snug or, or reestablishing that kind of normal anatomical configuration. And that's typically done through four or five small little incisions and putting some stitches in the muscle of the diaphragm, just like any other hernia, uh, to make that hole a little bit more snug or a little bit uh, smaller. The best way that I would explain that to patients, you know, because you guys like my analogies, is that if you had to take your car in for its brakes, typically they'll tell you that you need to fix the pads and the rotors. If you're lucky enough to get away with just replacing the pads, that's great. It's a little bit easier to do, but most of the time you end up fixing both components because if you have a bad rotor and you just change out the pads, those new pads are going to wear down very quickly. Similarly, if you uh, change out um, a new rotor and, and put out or leave the new or the old pads, that new rotor is going to wear down quickly too. So by fixing both components, you have a much better repair uh, of that valve barrier mechanism. Excellent. Thank you for that. And yes, we do love your analogies. We're going to um, use those in future. <laughs> they're great and they're so helpful for patients and, and viewers to really make that connection and get that deeper understanding of what's going on. Uh, can be very confusing at times. So thank you for that. Karen, I'll just ask you real quick again, do we have any questions from the chat group? We do, we have a, a couple of questions. Uh, one is from Jason. He's um, really wanting to, I guess, know about the durability of TIF. And his question is, if a patient is 10 years out from his TIF and notices some symptoms coming back, uh, is it safe? Uh, to go in and have more fasteners added? Can that cause any complications? That's a, that's, a, that's a great question because over time, the, the procedure has certainly evolved and um, the procedure was initially developed to just have 12 fasteners. So you'd have a couple of plications in either corner and then a couple of plications in, in, uh, across the face. So basically it was designed to have 12 little fasteners. Well, we found that over time, the concern was that if you put more fasteners, that there would be more risk. But what we found, it's, it's actually the opposite, that the more fasteners that are used, there's more fixation points and there's more areas of scar tissue that develop. And so theoretically, it would have more of an impact on durability and efficacy. Now, for patients that, let's say, started noticing symptoms, um, when, when people ask me about the durability, in general, we would say that 75 to 80 percent of the time people are satisfied with how it's controlling their symptoms at five years. And a lot of times five years is where people kind of measure things out because it's hard to track people for 10 years or 15 or 20 years. It's hard to keep track of people for even five years nowadays. But um, if you compare that to, let's say, the efficacy of the traditional fundoplication, whether it's a partial fundoplication or a complete nissen fundoplication, those procedures typically have a 75 to 80% satisfaction with regards to their reflux symptoms. 
I think in general, people heal in different ways, and some people just tend to heal better than others. There's certainly factors that go uh, that are involved with durability of some of these repairs because of the effect on the sutures. For patients that have a higher BMI or a little bit bigger in the midsection, it can cause a little bit more increased pressure, let's say on the abdomen, which then causes a little bit more tension on those stitches to potentially try to unravel. If you're always filling up your stomach, it tends to try to pull that that flat. And ultimately with time, as we know, things just don't stay as taut and things tend to get a little bit stretchier and a little bit looser and a little bit flabbier, unfortunately. And that's, there's no great way to turn back time. Um, but for patients that don't have a hiatal hernia that's come back, um, you can have a revision to add more fasteners and kind of reconstruct that flap valve mechanism. And it can be a very safe and viable option for patients, particularly if you did very well initially and then started noticing that it was deteriorating a little bit over time as that valve perhaps got a little bit looser. That makes sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Karen, did we have any more? We do. Uh, we've got a question from Matt. And uh, he's wondering uh, if you could kind of talk about the differences uh, with TIF and links. Uh, why should he get a TIF? And then he has, it's kind of a two-part question. The next question really isn't GERD related, but he is asking, is it true you can access the Atlantic Ocean from Appleton, Wisconsin via the Fox River? <laughs> I love well, Matt, it. That, <laughs> that is an absolutely great question. And absolutely, yes, you can access the Atlantic Ocean. And from a historical vignette, the oldest yacht club in the country is the New York Yacht Club. The second oldest is actually the Nina Yacht Club because they would travel across the, the waterways and go to Lake Winnebago because it's a relatively shallow lake in the summer that tends to have a relatively consistent prevailing wind. Um, and so in many ways they would summer um, by going back and forth along the seaway. So that's my little historical oh, vignette. I love that, it. Be, that being said, um, the, the Lynx procedure is certainly another alternative option from a minimally invasive approach that's an alternative to the traditional fundoplication. For those who don't know about that procedure, it's basically a bracelet of magnets. They're rare earth magnets encased in titanium on interlocking little links where the magnets attract at about 20 to 25 units of pressure. Reflux is typically occurring at five to 15, so it stays snug for that. And a normal esophagus can generate anywhere from 35 to 135 units of pressure to push food through to separate the magnets apart, and then the food would drop through. That's done by five small little incisions, and it's uh, basically uh, placing this new valve around the end of your esophagus. And again, it's it's very it's a very viable option provided that patients' esophaguses are are functional and squeezing like they're supposed to, and that you do have documented reflux. In many circumstances, that can be coupled with fixing the hiatal hernia as well. The potential benefit is that there is some potential increased durability because there's no stitches that can be pulled through. But the downside of it is, is that your esophagus has to always stay strong enough to be able to push food through. And so if the esophagus, for whatever reason, would get a little bit lazier, let's say, about um, actually pushing everything or clearing things through, then sometimes people feel a pooling sensation. And so there's a little bit of a trade-off of side effect profile for, for durability per se. And everybody's, you know, I guess uh, their, their choice as far as the direction or path that they want to go to try to fix their reflux symptoms is a little bit individually based. Um, and so we do both procedures here along with the traditional fundoplication. And I find that, you know, the biggest thing is to try to gather enough information preoperatively before choosing some type of intervention so that you can match up the potential treatment option that's going to be the most effective and durable, but that would also come with the least amount of risk and side effect for patients. And so for patients who are looking for a very effective procedure that comes with the least amount of risk and side effects, we would typically steer them towards a TIF procedure for the valve reconstruction with or without the hiatal hernia repair, depending on the size of the hiatal hernia during the course of that, um, during the course of their preoperative workup. Wonderful. Thanks for explaining all of that. We, we talk about it a lot. Every body is different. So 
you know, these reflex programs like yours that have a, you know, a, a robust offering, I think the most important thing is educated patients making decisions based on their, uh, their health. So thank you for being so, um, so uh, consultative in that, in that regard. Um, you talked a little bit about the TIF procedure. I, I'm curious to hear about diet. We get a ton of questions surrounding diet and um, what that looks like after the procedure as far as healing time. Um, you know, what foods are permissible and what does that post-procedure diet look like? Um, so I tell people with a with the surgery, there is typically a bit of swelling that would happen. And because the swelling involves the esophagus, it makes it a little bit more narrow. And so if people imagine having their tonsils taken out, ultimately you want things to go down a little bit easier. And so the from a visual standpoint, I'll try to get people to understand that there's a little bit of swelling that'll end up looking like a funnel at the end of the procedure. And the peak of swelling after the procedure usually is about 48 to 72 hours after that. And so just like any other funnel, liquid will go down a little bit easier. And the thinner it is, the easier it goes compared to being thicker. And walnuts don't necessarily go down through a funnel particularly well. And so people will typically stick with mushy stuff for the first week or two weeks, right? Now, it doesn't necessarily have to be water. It doesn't have necessarily have to be clear liquids. We typically say, you know, it just has to be kind of mushy so it goes down a little bit easier. And people had to become more of grazers rather than meal eaters in the sense that you want just to kind of keep snacking on just little mushy things during the course of the day and sip on something so that it goes down. And again, some people swelling is more than others. Sometimes people have issues with their esophagus not squeezing as well. So you have to kind of listen to your body and just kind of play it by ear and see what works. Typically, the moister it is, the easier it is to go down. Warm has a tendency to work better than cold, but sometimes people like ice cream. Most of the time, people end up losing somewhere around 10 pounds or so in the immediate post-operative period, which many people like. Um, and, and ultimately, the procedure is not designed to, to be for weight loss, but it's designed to help you eat smarter because in the initial post-operative period, if you eat too fast or if you eat too much, it hurts and, and pain's a wonderful motivator to guide you towards eating smarter. Now, ultimately, what will end up happening is that swelling goes down. People start adding more things in and then it becomes less important the what and more the how and how much, meaning that for people that do well long term, those are the people that kind of learn to kind of adapt to this. I call it the new normal in the sense that you're taking small bites, you're chewing your food well, you're eating slowly and you're never eating too much in any given time. If you think that normal following the procedure is a Hardee's commercial, and nothing against Hardee's, but hamburgers should never be this big, um, then you'll never be eating normal. And you'll probably never make any type of money back if you go to an old country buffet either. Um, but you can eat what you want under the you know caveat of small bites, chewing what you want, or chewing well, eating slowly, and never eating too much in a given time. It's fantastic advice too. It's really lifestyle change for good. It's not it, just it, it is. It is. I can fix the mechanical aspect of it, but I will tell people is that if you don't kind of adjust to the um, what brought you there in the first place, more than likely the symptoms will come back at some point in your lifetime. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Thank you for that. Karen, uh, before we tend to wrap up here, um, are there any other outstanding questions that you want to ask Dr. Janu? I think the last question uh, that just came in is from Diane. And and she's asking, um, you know, since we talked about the diet, she's wanting to know um, what about activity after the TIF procedure and are there any restrictions? Oh, that's a great question too. Mm -hmm. So typically we'll try to limit how much heavy lifting people do for about four weeks after the procedure. Some TIF um, surgeons will, will say six weeks. Some people will give different like weight limits. Ultimately, what I try to tell people is to exercise some degree of common sense in the sense that um, you shouldn't be doing a lot of exertion or adding pressure to your tummy for about four to six weeks after the procedure because the scar tissue that ultimately is going to determine its strength and durability gets to about 70% of its strength at six weeks. There's very little strength at first, but between four and six is where it really ramps up. And so if you're doing a job where you're either working at a computer or yelling at people, you can certainly go back to work much quicker than if you were working at a quarry. 
I would say most of the time people feel a little bit more tired than they think they should feel for the first week or so as their body adjusts to healing and the changes in diet and whatnot. But then after that, people feel pretty decent such that they'd be able to go back to most of their normal activities. For us in Wisconsin, I'll usually say if somebody asks you to move their ice shanty, you have to say no for those first four to six weeks. <laughs> The additional thing that I'll say is that there's a little voice in your head that'll tell you if you're doing something that you shouldn't. And women are pretty good at listening to that little internal voice. And for men that have this procedure, I'll usually ask them to listen to somebody else's voice because <laughs> men are notoriously bad at listening to that inner voice. So they have their wives, right? <laughs> or with significant other or somebody else yeah, that will kind of guide them towards behaving just in that first little period. Right. No, it's uh, definitely there is some onus, uh, a lot of onus on the patient after the procedure to ensure that their outcomes are optimal. So thank you for that. Um, Karen, was that the last question? I just wanted to touch base with you. I have one more that came in and I, it's, it's a great question. Um, just wanting to know, is TIF new and considered experimental and how safe is it? So just the safety profile. So from a safety profile, it's safer than having a colonoscopy by about tenfold. Um, the nice thing about the device is that it's very standardized. Um, it's it's gotten a lot better over time as far as um, the ability to introduce the device and, and some of the features that are involved in it make it much easier um, and safer to be done. So in general, it, it's extremely safe in the right setting. For patients that have, let's say, a very large hiatal hernia or their anatomy is a little bit off or they've had prior stomach surgeries, ultimately you have to kind of be a right candidate to have things done. Um, the procedure's been around since about 2008. Um, we started uh, doing our, we did our first patient in uh, February of 2010. Um, so it's been around for a considerable period of time. I would say that I do not believe that it's experimental. There's been an extensive amount of not only registry trials, but also randomized controlled trials that are even effective and equally as effective as, as traditional fundoplication in many circumstances. And there are some arguments to say from a physics standpoint that there might be some physiologic, that it's better in many ways. Um, but that being said, um, certain uh, insurance companies may still consider it experimental. That's um, based on um, a variety of different political arguments per se, um, but there are some uh, uh, insurance companies, including Medicare, that, that uh, approve it. Um, typically, if somebody is interested in having the procedure done, uh, we go through a pre-authorization um, uh, methodology that in many cases will work, even if the initial um, insurance company is, is denying it. That's excellent. Most most uh, patients have that question right out of the gates. You know, does insurance cover this? And it is, in fact, covered by Medicare, which is wonderful, but um, a lot of other insurances do do. Uh, do cover this. And with the help of your team navigating that, uh, it's just always a great question to ask. Um, so thank you for that. Um, we know, you know, you hear this every day, I'm sure, but there's so many patients who are just in this hamster wheel. They just don't know how to get out of the regime, their, their regular day to day, and they're still suffering. If you were to give advice to someone in that mode of just, you know, medications or lifestyle management, it's just not working. What would that be? What would that advice be? Well, I think a lot of it is just bringing it to the attention of your care provider or just, to, I guess, being aware of it as, as, as an issue that has potential treatment options. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, you know, another analogy that I'll give to people because sometimes the heartburn thing, you know, it, it, it manifests itself on such a spectrum of disease yeah. and it can mm -hmm. have so many different ways that it manifests itself in different people and whatnot. Sometimes it's just hard to get your, your, your brain around it and whatnot. It, you know, and I'll tell people if your knee bothered you, right, and you're taking pills every day to help your knee, if you do something silly, your knee's worse, and if you miss your medications, your knee's worse. At some point, it might trip your trigger to say, gosh, my knee bothers me enough that I should consider doing something about it. 
Well, what would you do? Well, you'd probably bring it up to your physician and talk about it. And then you'd probably get some testing done to see exactly what's wrong with your knee and then decide what you're going to do about it. And whether it's injections or staying on medications or having it um, arthroscopy or having it replaced, they all have their pros and cons. There's different methodologies for doing it and they all have their different like uh, risks and recoveries. And ultimately you want your knee to feel better. Is it possible you might still need some pills here and there for your knee? Yeah, it's possible. Is it going to last forever? Well, a little bit depends on how much you beat on your knee. That's a lot easier for people to kind of wrap their head around than the whole reflux thing. So I would say for people that, let's say, are taking a Prilosec in the morning and it's managing their symptoms and they don't necessarily are they're not bothered by anything that's totally fine right one pill a day is typically okay and it's going to have pretty negligible long-term consequences the problem that people run into is that you're if you're having breakthrough issues where you're needing to take two pills or maybe four pills or if you miss a dose suddenly you're missing work because you're having flare-ups of some symptoms or for patients that are are taking those medications and despite the medications are getting woken up at night or having trouble swallowing or the coughing or some of these kind of more content manifestations those are the patients that at least should consider having some investigations where i call it the information gathering phase to really see how significant it is if you determine it's significant enough right then there's a variety of different options that can you know, people can entertain. And what I would say is that your best bet is to try to find somebody who might be able to at least discuss all the different options yeah. rather than just simply saying, well, traditional fundoplication is probably the path to go. Mm -hmm. No, it's great advice. And thank you so much for that. Um, you know, it's, it's just having that discussion and having that discovery start and then following the path of recommendations by that physician. But when you don't talk about it, you're not going to be able to treat it. So um, thank you for that explanation and yet another analogy that's fantastic. Um, if you uh, wouldn't the mind, thing, Dr. Go ahead. And I would say that, you know, in, in many circumstances, you know, the TIF procedure, let's say, is a little bit newer, right? It's been around, sure, for the last decade, but at the same time, um, it, it is a treatment for reflux that in, in, in certain providers viewpoint might not necessarily be a viable option simply because they would extrapolate the fact that this might not be or might be similar to what traditional fundoplication would do with its potential risks and side effects and consequences. And this is a little bit different than that because it's effective, but it has a much lower side effect profile. And so if you do ask and you start reaching out and somebody says, I'm not sure if that's a great option, I would say that you can circumvent that by looking online and that you can go to girdhelp.com and find providers that are doing the procedure that would be able to help you at least talk about it. Ultimately, you know, people just kind of want information and it can certainly help guide by understanding what the anatomy is, how significant the reflux is, how the function of the stomach and how the function of the esophagus can all play a role in the context of food sensitivities and environmental sensitivity and side effect of medication. All that stuff kind of plays a role. So it's a little bit of a holistic approach to try to attack it because you want to know all the factors that are involved in it. And, and, and I think that you have to be your own advocate and patients are usually pretty good at researching um, things. And, and I encourage people to go on the internet and, and try to at least understand what's going on with them, but then, you know, go past the internet and actually reach out to somebody who might be able to answer their questions or give them some more expert advice. Yeah, excellent, excellent advice. Always encouraging patients to be advocates for themselves and their care. Um, thank you so much. And Dr. Janu, how can folks in Wisconsin and Appleton reach you if they're interested in talking with you about their GERD or their reflux? So our group is called Fox Valley Surgical Specialists. Um, it could certainly be found online. Our our website is uh, uh, Fox Valley Surgical Associates is FVSA or FVSAWI.com. Um, for patients in Wisconsin, you can certainly look up refluxwi or refluxwisconsin.com as well. It's another website where we put together some videos of the procedures that are a little bit cartoony. They're not gross. You can find the gross ones on YouTube if you want, but it gives a little bit more information about our practice from a reflux standpoint. Um, 
but certainly reaching out, um, calling the office, it's 920-731-8131, or talking to their primary care providers locally, and they can reach out to us and get a referral started as well. Wonderful, thank you. And, and as Dr. Janu said, if you're outside of the Wisconsin, Appleton, Chilton, area, um, please visit GERDhelp.com to um, utilize the physician finder and find a physician in your area who can help or start having those discussions. I want to wrap up this evening to say a sincere thank you to both Karen for being here and helping with the questions as well as Dr. Janu just being here and sharing your expertise with the audience. It's, it's so powerful. Happy to be here. Thanks. We for appreciate it. Um, and everyone, thank you for joining us this evening. And uh, please share what you learned with your friends and family. And remember what we talked about earlier about GERD Awareness Week and um, the Giving for GERD Awareness. Uh, we have a, a fun recipe and some great food items that are recommended, recommended as reflux-friendly donations. So as you uh, plan your giving this year, please um, take a peek at that list. If you post in chat, we'll get something out to you after the session. Thank you all for joining and hopefully you have a very uh, nice evening and uh, we'll see you next week for our TIFF Talk Tuesday. Okay, great. Thanks everyone. <laughs>